Digital marketing is more competitive than ever, but if you can answer these five questions, you will blow up the leads and sales that you get next year. I know, because that's exactly what we've done for our clients, making them millions in the process. And by the way, stick around for the fifth question as it's one of the most profitable digital marketing activities I've ever seen. In all likelihood, your competitors will be spending more time and money over the next 12 months on digital marketing than they ever have done before. You can compete with this in one of two ways. You can outspend them or you can outthink them. If you want to outthink them, it's really important that you nail your positioning and your differentiation. Now, this area is often overlooked. Typically, people just want to get more traffic because that's the fun stuff. By the way, I agree. Don't worry. We'll come back to that later on. But getting this right makes everything else easier. Companies that don't get this right struggle to get traction, end up overpaying for their traffic and generally have really low conversion rates. So your first question is, who are you really selling to and why should they buy from you rather than your competitors? This is one simple question that can be so difficult to answer. In fact, even when you think you have an answer, it's a good idea to check back every 12 months to make sure that it's still true and make sure that that answer is conveyed through all of your marketing, including across your website. Let me give you some examples. Who are luxury watchmaker Patek Philippe selling to and why should people buy from them? Well, Patek sells these watches for hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars. On their website, they emphasize and tell the story. This is all about craftsmanship. This is about the best materials and the finest craftsmanship. They talk about how it can take months to build each piece. Fundamentally, what they're selling is a complicated piece of jewelry that if you wear one, people will know you're rich. It's a signaling tool for status and wealth. Now, just to go to the opposite end of the spectrum, what is fast fashion retailer Shein selling, who to, and why should people buy from them? Their target audience is pretty clear through the images that they're using across the site. And you may even pick up once or twice a hint of their discount positioning. And not just because it's Black Friday, it's pretty much like this every day. Who are software company Salesforce selling to and why should people buy from them rather than one of their competitors? Well, they actually call out the industries that they sell to here. If you go onto any of these pages, you get a custom message explaining why Salesforce benefits people in your industry. Now, the message that Salesforce uses across the site and throughout their marketing is all about growth. The clues in the name, Salesforce. They talk about how you grow your revenue. They talk about how you speed up sales and growth. They talk about how you grow your business. If we contrast this with Zoho, which is another software company that sells CRMs, you can see their messaging is completely different. Your life's work powered by our life's work. Built by a company that values your privacy. It doesn't talk here about boosting sales at all. So this Salesforce message is very clearly designed to resonate with a particular type of customer that cares mostly about business growth. Now, all your digital marketing efforts will only ever be as successful as your website. The vast majority of your traffic and in all likelihood, most of your leads and sales is going to be coming through your website. So your website should be working hard for you. It should set a great first impression to visitors. It should allow you to add and change content really easily without having to negotiate with the developer. And you should be able to see exactly what's happening to the traffic on your site to see where people are falling off. When I'm giving a talk at a seminar, I like to have a bit of fun with the audience. I've got a big screen behind me and I say, right, I need a volunteer to put their website up on the screen so that we can all rip it apart for a few minutes. You watch everyone sort of shrivel into their seats, hoping that I don't pick on them. The punchline is, wow, imagine that you're so embarrassed about your website that you wouldn't even put it on this big screen in front of all these potential customers. If you had a salesperson that you were so embarrassed about, you wouldn't send them into a room full of potential customers. You'd train that person or replace them pretty quickly. So why set lower standards for your website? So your second question is, honestly, how proud are you of your website? And does it deliver on your 12 month growth goals? If not, the next question is, how quickly can you get this result? And by the way, if you're not sure whether or not you should be embarrassed about your website or it'll deliver on your 12 month growth goals and you want an outsider's perspective, a professional's opinion, then request a free website review from the team here at Exposure Ninja. Just go to Exposure Ninja dot com or click the link in the description right now. It's amazing. One trend that's showing no sign of slowing down is the importance of owning your own data. Now more than ever, your marketing needs to result in some sort of data collection. Followers are great, views are great, subscribers are great. But if you've got your potential customers contact details, you've got a much better chance of making the sale because you can follow up with them via email or SMS, you can remarket and retarget to them. This furniture e-commerce store will pay you five pounds if you give them your email address because then it allows them to follow up with you if you don't complete your purchase and get through to checkout. Energy company Octopus offers you a free estimate on the cost of your heat pump. You go through a questionnaire and guess what the last stage is after you've put in all of your details and you've thought about where you put this heat pump. Email capture. 
Now, by that stage, you've both sunk cost into filling in the form and you've kind of given them a whole bunch of information already. So giving them your email address feels much less painful if it's the last step in the process. Going back to Salesforce, Salesforce will try and capture your email whether you want to start a free trial or even if you just want to watch some demos. Does this mean that fewer people are going to watch their demos than if they didn't put it behind an email capture? Sure. But they've obviously weighed up that it's worth getting less demo views, but getting the email addresses of people that watch the demos than just opening it up to everyone. And if you've got a great sales team or great automatic follow-up, that is often the case. So your third question then is how are you incentivizing people to give you their contact details? Today more than ever, we marketers are spoilt for choice with traffic sources. We've got different flavors of SEO, we've got paid search, we've got Amazon, we've got paid social, we've got podcasts, videos, webinars, digital PR. It's easier than ever to get distracted by the latest and greatest shiny object. Remember how Clubhouse was changing the game? Despite all of the change and all of the noise, the key to effective marketing is focus. Particularly if you've got limited resources, and by the way, every business has limited resources, deciding where to allocate your time, energy, and budget can make the difference between finding a great source of customers and being able to scale it and spreading yourself so thin that you never really get traction in any one area. So question four is, where are your potential customers spending the most time online and what is your plan to reach them this year? Okay, how do you identify where your customers hang out? Well, there's three main ways. Firstly, you can go to analytics, Google Analytics, whatever analytics platform that you're using. Don't just look at where the most traffic is coming from, look at where the most traffic that converts is coming from. The second way that you can do this is by spying on your competitors. So stick them into SEMrush, free trial at thankyouninjas.com. Have a look at what they're ranking for, how much they're spending on advertising. Go and have a look at what they're running in the Facebook ad library. Have a look at all their social channels and see where they're putting their attention. The third way and my favorite way to identify where your potential customers are hanging out online is to talk to them. You can do much worse than pick up the phone and talk to some of your best customers and just find out from them where do you spend your time online? Which social platforms do you use? If you were looking for something like what we sell, what would you do? This can be a really useful exercise to help you build a picture of your perfect customer in your head. Not to get too weird, but you can then run ideas past this sort of mental picture of your perfect customer in your head. And it's really useful when you wanna quickly test things that you're thinking of implementing in your marketing. The most successful and fastest growth clients that we work with are prioritizing one to three different marketing channels. Now that's not to say they're only working on one to three, they might be working on 10, but they're prioritizing one to three because they know that these are where they're gonna get the outsized rewards. Let me give you some examples. We've got a B2B client that we've blown up using organic and paid search. Now they're selling something that people know they need, so they're searching for it, and they're selling into a known problem. So people know that they've got the problem, so they're searching for the problem as well as the solution. So search makes a huge amount of sense for them. We've got another client that sells direct to consumer chocolate and chocolate with benefits. So this is a new concept to people. So rather than targeting search for something that people don't even know exists yet, we run paid ads on social for them, which has been really, really effective and generated huge return on investment. If you think about it, we need to introduce people to the concept and the brand. Now, over time, once people are familiar with the concept and the brand, they might start searching for it. And at that point, running search ads and getting them ranking on Google is gonna make loads of sense. But in the meantime, when we're doing this introduction, paid social makes so much sense for them and their ROI because this is a relatively new concept. You know your email list? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. That list of people in your MailChimp account that you know you're gonna contact one day, but you just haven't got around to it yet. I see ya. Most businesses have way more money in their email list than they could possibly imagine. Let me give you an example. So we work with a furniture retailer and they had an email list which they've kind of accidentally built over time, but they didn't really run any emails to them, which is a fairly common situation. Now, the first thing that we did is we set up one of those annoying pop-ups that open when you land on a page, offering you an incentive to submit your email address. By the way, the reason that they're annoying is because everyone does them, and the reason that everyone does them is because they work. This allowed us to start capturing lots more email addresses. The next thing that we did is we built some automated email sequences that were triggered based on a visitor's behavior on their website. So if you just signed up for the email form, but you didn't go through and browse the website, we will put you in what's called a welcome sequence. 
This would give you a drip-fed series of emails that would introduce the business, the brand, and their values. If you went on to browse the website and had a look at some product categories, we'd send what's called a browse abandonment sequence. So this is a sequence of emails optimized for people that have been browsing through products on their site, but didn't add anything to cart. If you added something to your cart, we would send you a cart abandonment sequence. So this is designed to get people back into their cart or their basket to complete the purchase. And of course, if someone purchased from them, we sent them a series of emails which were designed to encourage repeat purchase, advocacy, so sharing with their friends, and also leaving a review for the business online. Now, it took a bit of time to get these email streams set up. We had to design, write, plan the emails, and then put them in and set the timers. But now, these automated email sequences will run on autopilot forever, picking up sales and reviews. In fact, for the first six months that these sequences were live, they made an ROI of 11 times. That means for every one pound this business invested in us building out these streams, they made 11 pounds back. And that will only increase over time as these campaigns continue to run, picking up more and more sales. We also know that for every new subscriber to the welcome sequence, they are on average going to be worth 20 pounds to our client. That completely changes the finance of some of their traffic channels because rather than just relying on a sale for the conversion value, they can drive people to an email sign up knowing that these sequences will turn them to a customer on autopilot and on average each of these subs will be worth 20 pounds to them now of course if you're a software or service business you're more likely going to want to automate some or all of your sales pipeline follow-up and you probably should but the key is that this stuff should as much as possible be automated if it's automated, you know exactly the same thing is happening every time, which allows you to track and optimize. Remember too that this is your secret weapon against higher traffic costs. If your competitors are only monetizing people when they make a purchase on the website, but you're making money when someone makes a purchase or signs up for your email list because you know that they'll become a customer later, there is only one winner in that battle, and it's not your competitors. So your final question, how do you follow up with leads and customers automatically to make sure that they repurchase, advocate and leave reviews for you? Now, most people love focusing on where they get more traffic to their websites from, but very rarely do people actually focus on how to monetize more of their existing traffic. One of the most effective and high leverage ways to do this is to identify a call to action or CTA that really generates lots of leads and sales from your existing website visitors. This video shows you exactly how to do that. And by the way, let me know in the comments, what's your top digital marketing problem at the moment? We use this to identify what topics to make videos about in future. See you soon.